is Sarah Hesterman, and today I will be talking about um, sexual violence and harassment against women in politics, combating threats facing female politicians in Austria. And I just wanted to warn everybody, I will be using language uh, regarding sexual violence, so if that's something that you don't feel like sticking around for, that's totally okay, and I'll just give you a few seconds to leave if you'd like to. Okay, so I'm just gonna get into it now. Um, so oh, here are some statistics about this problem, kind of putting it in a global scope. So 46.9% of female parliamentarians around the world have received death threats or threats of rape or beating. 58.2% um, have been targeted by online sexist attacks. And 67.9% have received comments about their physical appearance or comments based on gender stereotypes. And this is from a survey done by the Interparliamentary Union in 2018, um, where they surveyed female politicians from around the world and these statistics don't communicate the story um, and don't really communicate the personal experiences but I do think they do a good job of showing just how international this problem is and why it's so important that it's addressed. So to frame my research, um, the issue that I set out to kind of tackle was how women politicians are experiencing threats of sexual violence and harassment. And violence against women in politics is physical, sexual, psychological. Um, it can occur at any level, at the local level, state level, the national level. Um, and in 2018, the European Parliament established that sexism and the sexual psychological harassment of women in politics is real and it's widespread. And that needs to be addressed. So um, obviously, as I've already established, politically active women on almost every continent have faced threats of sexual violence and harassment while holding public office. Um, but in the Austrian context specifically, Austrian women are both underrepresented in government and they're also living in a country facing challenges in violence prevention. Um, this was said by the Austrian presidency of the Council of Europe of the European Union in 2018. So also just to put it in perspective, um, in 2018, Austrian female politicians held about 34% um, of the seats. So there's still clearly a large disparity there. So the question that I wanted to explore was how do female politicians in Austria perceive and respond to the threat of sexual violence and harassment? And I initially was interested in going to Vienna during my Iris semester because I wanted to work at the Women Without Borders organization. Um, and they do work to combat gender inequality all around the world. Um, but I'm also really interested in kind of tackling inequalities in political processes. And I just found that given the statistics I've just shared that Austria was a really interesting study for that. Um, just, it really straddles this world between kind of a conservative, um, literally geographically kind of conservative Eastern Europe and then the more progressive um, Western part of Europe. So it's a very interesting place um, geopolitically. So the theoretical framework that I use was social construction feminism. And this is basically just explaining how gender dictates um, power and privilege. So we learn gender as a societal construct. Um, we're taught what it is growing up, um, something created by humans, but this perpetuates stereotypes and it's also positioning women to be viewed as unequal. Um, one way that this happens is when we're talking about career choice for women. So um, for example, many women feel pressure to choose between a family or a career because they've been positioned in this way um, where they're confined to a domestic sphere instead of a public sphere and political life is a public sphere. Um, so therefore we can kind of understand how this backlash happens um, and why it's underpinned by these stereotypes. Um, yeah, and these false perpetua perpetuations of women being unequal. So here is a quote from one of the interviews that I held. Um, sexual harassment and violence against female politicians is very rarely regarded and not spoken about as much as I wish it would be. And I thought this kind of encapsulated my research really well. Um, I'll get into who Yana is in a bit, but um, she's a politician in Austria that I interviewed. But um, yeah, I thought it kind of sums up really how there is this taboo regarding sexual violence in Austria still. Um, and people are talking about it. There are people that are talking about it, but not very widespread. Um, and also the people who experience it are facing fear of repercussions um, and a variety of other things I'll also get into. But yeah, I really appreciated um, Yana saying this. So my methodology, I use field notes, an anonymous survey and semi-structured interviews. And I really wanted to use um, specifically the last two methods because I felt like they were communicating the politicians' experiences in their own words and that was something that I could then communicate on behalf of them 
in this study, obviously anonymously to protect their privacy, but it was really important to me that these stories were being prioritized over literature, over anything else, because it was coming directly from the people experiencing them. And that's so important, especially when we talk about sexual assault survivors and how important their narratives are. So yeah, my field notes, just a collection of detailed field observations um, relating to my research, whether it was watching a political protest and observing how that was happening with police interaction or just overhearing conversations about female politicians. Um, that's kind of what I wrote about that substantiated some of my research. Um, also, my anonymous survey, it was an opportunity for the politicians to, to share their feelings and experiences regarding threats of sexual violence. And I asked them about what they experienced during their campaigns, um, or not specifically what they've experienced, but if they've experienced it and gave them the option if they wanted to speak about it to do so. Um, so during their campaigns, um, while in office, and then actions that they felt like um, could or should have been taken in order to mitigate this issue. And this qualitative data really allowed me to get a more um, comprehensive understanding of how many Austrian female politicians are affected by threats of sexual violence and harassment. And I emailed this URL to 200 uh, women politicians across Austria, to so many different levels of government from the local, the very, very local, to to the absolute national. Um, I ended up getting 15 full responses, which I was very happy about because it provided me with a lot of insight um, into this issue across the board. Also, I just wanted to mention the um, survey was translated from English into German by a native German speaker, and then they also translated the answers back. So that's how I navigated the language barrier. Um, in terms of my semi-structured interview, I really wanted to gather information from women in all different government positions and kind of see how um, their thoughts on this issue might have differed or might have been similar. Um, so I interviewed a member of a city council, the very local level, a member of a state parliament, so a bit more regional, and then a member of the national council. Uh, and this was really important for me in order to make sure that I could like ask follow-up questions and kind of have a more personal report with somebody who, um, which you can't really get from that anonymous survey. Um, and I also mostly made these connections either through my internship with Women Without Borders um, or just doing my own networking. So my findings, I will not read these all out loud right now um, as I'm about to go through them, but as you can see, I came up with a number of really surprising observations in some cases and other cases and um, more obvious observations. Um, but yeah, overall, I think it was a really great way to contextualize this problem in Austria while also maybe speaking to the wider global nature of it. So out of 18 participants, and in, that includes the interviewees and the respondents to the survey, um, 16 believe that the threat of sexual violence and harassment is an issue facing women politicians in Austria. Obviously, there are some people that do not believe this is an issue, and that's completely okay because that's been their experience, but clearly a large majority of them do believe this is an issue that is widespread throughout the country. So sexual harassment and violence as a topic in Austrian society. Um, I've included some quotes directly from the survey and from the interview here. Um, as you can see, uh, some of the respondents say that Austria is better off than many other countries, that women and girls suffer every day, um, that there's a huge taboo regarding the uh, topic in Austrian society, but they're hearing less and less women, it's your fault. Um, and that overall it's improving slowly um, and that the climate for women is improving slowly, but men are still finding it easier to move forward in a male dominated system. And this is something that was repeated often throughout the surveys and throughout the interviews. So creating recognition of the issue is also very important. I had a respondent tell me this conversation is needed, um, which I think is very telling about the climate of this topic in Austria. Um, I had a, one of my interviewees mention to me um, how they've received bad comments online and how they've had colleagues who have received rape threats, really violent threats. Um, and the fact that this is not being addressed on a wider scale is terrifying when you're considering how um, severe and serious threats like this are and how they really impact women's feeling of personal safety. Um, and finally, um, as you can see here, respondent number eight says the public needs more enlightenment, make visible the existing harassment. So there's kind of this feeling, which was also echoed throughout all of the responses I got in the interviews, that there needs to be more conversation about this issue. Objectification and judgment of physical appearance was also wi widely mentioned. Um, it's important for women to look good, only then are we not judged so harshly. I think we are harassed more about our looks. We face a lot of backlash for things that men don't see. 
Uh, this kind of ties back to social construction feminism and the idea of what a woman should be. But women, as we saw in the earlier statistic as well, women receive a high, women in politics receive a high number of comments about their looks. It's easy to see if you just go on social media, go on Twitter, go on Facebook, you can see it for yourself. It's widespread, it's um, prevalent, and that is something that women feel like they are experiencing at a much higher level than men while in office. The rise of anti-feminism was mentioned um, with the politics in Austria shifting further right, how this is becoming something that is limiting women's political, um, political speech and the freedom that they have to speak freely about political issues. Um, and also this idea of feminism as a dirty word came up and how women are called feminists in a negative way when they're just trying to speak out for themselves or talk about women's issues. And then social media as a conduit of sexual violence against women. Um, there were a lot, so I asked specifically both in my interview and my survey about how the relationship um, the politicians have with social media was characterized or how they characterized that. Um, and there were some that said that social media is great for getting out their platform and talking about their ideas, but others, many others also mentioned um, how they receive a lot of the comments, a lot of the threats over social media. So, uh, for example, respondent number 12 said, I use a lot of social media. It is a lot of work to delete the stupid comments. And um, Yana said, it is difficult to read comments about oneself, about appearance, about violent things, dirty things. So social media became, becomes kind of this way of communicating violence and becomes a tool that's leveraged in making these threats and making these women politicians feel unsafe or feel unwelcome in an online space. So some of the politicians proposed solutions are people of all genders standing in solidarity against perpetrators, legal action to criminalize threats of sexual violence and harassment, increasing public awareness through educational campaigns and removing the taboo surrounding sexual violence. And all of these solutions are kind of interlocking. They all rely on each other, um, but Overall, I think my main takeaway from these solutions is that more needs to be done in civil society and in the political um, structures of the Austrian government in order to combat this issue. And that is being voiced directly from women politicians in Austria. That is what they're saying. So to analyze and discuss my findings, overall, a, so a societal taboo, a lack of education on the issue, and a lack of legislation regarding the issue is leading to inaction. Inaction in civil society, inaction in political, um, in the political happenings and in government. And social media is the primary platform for threats of sexual violence and harassment. This is the main way that the women politicians reported receiving these threats um, and facing this kind of violence was on social media, which I think leads to a larger conversation of how do we make social media a safe place um, for women and for women politicians to feel like they can express themselves or even just be online without facing um, threats, without limiting freedom of speech. And that's something that's come up in court cases and that's something that comes up a lot um, in think pieces or what have you in this discussion. Um, it's a very, very important aspect of this issue. And then the rise of far right politics is reversing the progress women have made in Austria. That's another uh, sentiment that I heard a lot. And I think it's important to, that we need to better understand how this um, rise of far-right politics will affect women's issues, both in public life and in their private life and the political sphere um, and beyond. And then finally, like I mentioned previously, the Austrian government and civil society should do more to target threats of sexual violence and harassment facing um, women politicians. And the way that this was kind of asked for was, for example, the creation of task force um, within the government to combat cyber harassment. Um, and then also just having legal, wa legal ways to address these issues, persecuting people for comments that they make online that are threatening, um, so on and so forth. So some of the limitations I have was it's a highly sensitive topic. Um, therefore, it's really important that I respect how people might feel about it to make sure that they feel safe. Um, furthermore, their privacy concerns, there are privacy concerns obviously related to being a public figure because there's a fear of backlash and there's a fear um, of speaking out oftentimes on this issue, which is why I wanted to make sure it was so anonymous. Um, there's also an inability to analyze more facets of identity such as race or class because the government in Austria is not very diverse at all. And 
I think this study would be great if it was replicated in a place where those factors could also be addressed um, to see what different effects of this, these threats might be um, when, when looking at different facets of identity. Yeah, and then overall, I think further research should be conducted to investigate the taboo of sexual violence in Austrian society, to understand the impact of far-right politics on women's rights, and definitely to construct legal options for politicians who receive threats. This was, by and away, the largest request from the women politicians that I got responses from or that I spoke to, that legal options are needed, they're necessary, and this is something that needs to be taken to court when women are feeling unsafe and people need to be held accountable for what they're doing. So one more quote, um, we can do more, we can do more every day. I love my job, but do not want to live in a world where this can happen to me and my friends. So I think this shows that there are so many women politicians who love what they do, or even if they don't love what they do, they're doing their job and they're um, representing people and trying to be there for the people. And this kind of, these threats and this harassment really prohibits them from being able to do this um, and to serve their community because it instills fear, um, and it just makes women politicians feel unsafe. Um, so yeah, that's why it's so important that we mitigate this issue and that we just spread awareness for it and we talk to each other about it. Um, and then from there, we can take action. So thank you very much. Here's my information. I'll put it in the group chat as well. That's a lot of references. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for that informative, amazing uh, presentation. Thank we you. already have some questions popping up in the chat, my dear. So uh, one uh, from uh, Nicole, amazing job, loved your presentation. Have you seen the solutions in your research uh, expressed in other political spaces you've been in, such as the UN? Yeah, so interestingly enough, um, when I was doing my research, I found a lot of UN documents that were addressing this issue, but a lot of time I find that the language is kind of flowery. So it's, it's acknowledging that female politicians or women politicians are facing violence, but then when that actual work happens, I think most of the time that is shouldered by local organizations on the ground who don't receive funding, um, especially when we're talking in, about in the global south. I think th there's not really a lot of um, attention brought to the work that is already being done of these small organizations. And then in the, with the UN, I think they might get or not just to call it the UN, but many international organizations or like the European Union, the regional organization, um, they're giving language to the issue, which is very important to spread awareness, but then there's not actual um, tangible like effort, I think that's being made to address the issue. And it's also hard because it's kind of like a liminal space kind of thing. Cause it's like, how do you deal with social media? Like, how do you deal with that now? I think as we're going into a, new age like when somebody there's legal ways to deal with people threatening you to your face and like having that physical contact but how do you do do it on an online space so i think some organizations need to catch up with that and then also if there are ones being um proactive and working on that on the ground it's not really brought to light that much wow thank you here's a question from reiner braun uh did the political or ideological orientation of the women uh politicians affect their responses Definitely. I, so in, um, the two responses that I mentioned that said that they did not think it was an issue did identify themselves as being, um, one was a part of the FPO, which is like the farther right conservative party in Austria. Um, and then another one said that they were a conservative. So they identified themselves, which was interesting because when they were saying that it wasn't an issue or that they hadn't seen it, um, which once again, that's their personal experience. But when they were talking about that, they did also, I think, feel, it seemed like they felt the need to show where they aligned politically, whereas I didn't get that with other responses. They didn't really come forward, which is, again, completely fine. Um, so I am i don't know if that's enough proof to show that like on a wide scale, that would be the case. Um, but yeah, definitely in my research, I found that the two people that identified as conservative politicians um, denied it was an issue. And then some, one of them even said something like, um, women are making too much of a de big deal about this. Like there, there is, yeah, there, there's um, a little bit of that going on. And then also I think when politicians are speaking about these issues in public, I guess you can kind of tell like which side maybe is um, supporting which <laughs> viewpoint. But yeah, in my research, it came up a little bit. 
very interesting. Uh, here's a, I think we have time for a last question from uh, Zunka, uh, which is, um, what have been the challenges and opportunities of tackling these important questions in an unfamiliar mm -hmm. political context? Um, I think I, because we do have limited time, I maybe want to focus on the second part of the yeah. question, which is, um, what are new insights, perspectives, and did it provide you uh, with anything um, in relation to the more familiar US context? So, yeah, that's a good question. What, because what, insight, what insights did, uh, did this, mm -hmm. gen, more general insights did this awaken for you, in, especially in the US, UN, US context? Yeah, absolutely. So I think first and foremost, um, it made me look at the US, not the US government, but how people are um, treating women politicians in the US a lot more critically in a way that I think I hadn't before, because I think subconsciously um, it's easy to find this kind of harassment becomes normalized um, when you're exposed to it so much and trying to be active, pol politically active um, in different ways. Yeah, I, I, I think being able to study in a context outside of the US allowed for um, kind of that <laughs> like jolting out of the normalization of sexual harassment and violence against women politicians in the United States. Um, and then just made me far more aware of it than I was before, which is horrible because I should have been aware of it before but it's something that you just like grow up seeing and you become used to even for example in the um i just in any election <laughs> like right now i'm doing my capstone um paper on the global scope of this issue so i'm kind of like widening it to a global lens and i've definitely found in the u.s like politicians that i really looked up to and really admire talking openly about receiving threats of rape threats of sexual violence and that's something i didn't even know about until starting this um, project so yeah i think being able to take it outside of my context in an environment where like I really didn't know that much going into it um, and just kind of like started from scratch or gave me that kind of framework, that, that analytical framework that I could bring back to the United States and now apply to what is happening here in a more thoughtful and more analytical way than before. So. You just made a great argument for global studies and experiential learning and global uh, how you can get ripped out of your context and it allows mm -hmm turn to have new insights and um, bring your knowledge home, as we like to say. So thank you again, Sarah. Can you put thank your you. Uh, email in the yes. chat? Thank you, everybody. In the conversation? Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Roshane Green. Um, I am a graduating senior here at LIU Global. My advisor was Nigel Hayes. Um, so my uh, case study was on tourists, expats, volunteers, and interns in Bali, Indonesia, and how volunteerism, how volunteerism impacts a developing country and the volunteer. So the why. Um, before, you know, you can really get passionate or uh, really drive anything home. You kind of have to have a why. Without a why, you're just kind of floundering around. So it took me a while to find my why um, or exactly how I wanted to answer my why. Uh, but my why, I guess, has been pretty consistent. It's always been around tourism. Um, so just, I guess, a little background to that kind of uh, explains a little bit about my interest in tourism. I am a first generation American. Um, my father still lives in Jamaica and um, my whole family is Jamaican. So tourism is something that's very popular in Jamaica. And I guess what got me interested at the beginning was I remember going to an all inclusive with my father and looking around and noticing that all of the Jamaicans that were there were either entertainers, uh, people working like desk jobs or uh, cleaning rooms, the cooks, um, and then everybody else was foreign and from a different country and kind of imported into um, Jamaica. And I was curious and I asked, I asked my father why it was that, you know, Jamaicans didn't work in upper management or I didn't see more Jamaicans at the hotel. And he told me that most of the Jamaicans who worked there couldn't even afford a night there on a month's salary. And it just was really baffling to me because all of the all-inclusives and um, resorts have private beaches. So some people 
two million people, actually the population of Jamaica, will live on an island and maybe never see some of their best beaches. And to me, that was very interesting. And I wondered, like, what was what was some of the history behind that? How could we move, you know, closer to an equal system? Why do so many people vacation in quote unquote developing countries? Um, and yeah, so that that's who I am, and that's why this means something to me. The global and local significance, I think it's pretty clear one in 10 jobs in the world right now are involved somewhere in the tourism industry. So that's your people who work in hotels, airlines, um, food related to tourism. So one in 10 jobs in the world. Um, so it's definitely a global issue. It's not right now, it's something that has almost come to a complete halt because of coronavirus. But I, I see it picking back up and never truly slowing down. We're just in a globalized world at this point. And then Bali, Indonesia is a place that I went my first actual semester in the global program because I transferred in. Um, and I fell in love. It was an amazing place. It reminded me of Jamaica, you know, in the, I guess, Pacific. It was just an amazing place to be and so culturally rich and such a, uh, tourist destination. So I decided probably the minute I landed that this is where I wanted to come back to do my research. So this is your typical beach resort strip with a bunch of humongous hotels. And that is in Jamaica, where I'm from. This is another typical beach strip filled with hotels. And this is in Bali. So my methodology, um, I did, I went to Bali for four months. Um, and while I was there, I had an internship. Um, I worked at Kim's Women's Center, which was an amazing place. I worked with another student who goes to Global, Jesse Bland. She also worked there and three people interning from Amsterdam and one person from Germany. Um, so it was a very interesting place and it was a great place to get interviews from both locals and volunteerism and interns. Um, field observation, I did most of my field observation in Changu and Ubud because those are the very tourist centric uh, locations in Bali. I did unstructured and semi-structured interviews that included locals, people who work in the volunteer, volunteer volunteer industry of tourism, um, the people who hire, co-workers, and other just regular tourists. Um, and then participatory observation. And then some of my, some of my uh, limitations was obviously time. I was only there for three months, so I wouldn't be able to research the entire uh, tourism industry of Bali. Um, so it limited the amount of organizations I was able to make contact with, limited the amount of people I was able to make contact with. Um, and there's just so many different facets of volunteerism. You have your babysitting. Um, Julia earlier in the session talked on teaching English. Um, yeah, so there's just so many building construction. There's just so many different facets working on a farm of volunteerism. Um, so obviously I wouldn't be able to get through all of that. Let's go into the how. So this is just a deeper look at my methodology, um, my unstructured interviews. I spoke to three people who had previously done volunteerism programs, three locals who had facilitated foreigners. Um, most of my field observations were done in Changu, Puta, and Abud. Um, for participatory observation, I interned at Kim's. So yeah, this is basically the nuts and bolts of how I went about my research. So my thoughts on what I learned while I was in Bali, the pros, I'll start with the pros. Um, tra the traveling locals. So by that, I met a very interesting young lady. Um, Tons of really cool conversations is how my research kind of came together. 
but she was giving me a perspective that I had never really thought of, um, where she was telling me she feels like she travels the world every day when she comes out. Um, it was a Balinese young woman. Um, she feels like she travels the world every day because of all of the foreigners that are coming into Bali. So it's like getting to travel the world without leaving your backyard. So I thought that was a very interesting and positive take. So it was something I thought I should include. Oh, didn't mean to go. Um, the money. Obviously, uh, it does bring some money into these local economies. It does provide jobs for people who may not have been able to find other work. So it does bring opportunity. Um, and transfer of cultures. One of the biggest things I heard from people who did do any type of volunteering or interning in another country is that they feel like they've personally grown so much from the experience and that they've changed and they've learned so much more about the world. But I found it very interesting in each interview, every time they talked about how much they had gained, because I felt like they talked very little bit about how much they had left in the country or what they did, what, they, what their purpose was for being there, but they talked about all the things they've learned. Um, and then as far as cons go, um, you have cost of living. Um, the problem with the destination becoming very popular and a super tourist destination is that the cost of living is going to rise because you have businesses that are trying to push people out. Um, the local community tends to find that it's more, it makes more sense for them to rent out their family compounds as homestays than it does for them to live there. So you have people moving out of homes that they've lived in for generations after generations because it just financially makes the most sense. Um, the environment. Um, the environment is one of those things that, you know, regularly gets trashed by the tourism industry. One, because a lot of people don't really go into countries knowing that much. It's not like, you know, they tell you at the airport, hey, Bali's dealing with some water shortage issues and we're a tiny island. We don't really have anywhere to put our trash. So when everybody comes and they're like, oh, I don't want to get Bali belly. I can't drink the water. And then everybody's using all of these one-time use plastic containers and tossing them, there's really nowhere for it to go when your island is already this big. It's a similar problem we have in Jamaica, as well as many small islands. Um, yeah, so environment, it's one of those things where if you don't know, you don't know. I've traveled before and wasn't aware of the local issues that were going on there. Um, and when I went back to Bali, it was just very eye-opening to be like, wow, had I not been a part of this class, I would have never really known unless I sought that information out. Um, and then underqualified people. So um, I, back to Julia's point that she was speaking on earlier, um, you have people who aren't qualified to do certain teaching positions, nursing positions, all these different positions that they go into these quote unquote developing countries and they're kind of able to set up shop and do things sometimes with almost no oversight. It's luckily getting a little better now because of some of the tragedies that have happened. But I just think it's very interesting because I think that if somebody came from Bali or Jamaica or Uganda and decided to practice medicine on children here, that people would be outraged and would not understand why that was a thing, people who weren't licensed. And then the money, where does the money go? I put it in the positive, but there is this effect called tourism leakage. And basically with tourism leakage, what happens is the money that's left in the local economy after most people, I mean, obviously it's going to differ person to person. You have people who use a lot more local um, products and stores and stays, homestays. But for the most part, when people do go to these countries, less than 10% of it benefits locally and less than 5% of that is going to actually hit the community that you're staying in. So it's, it's one of those things where I, 5% is better than nothing, but there has to be a better way for this system to operate. And here's another stretch of beach, Cancun. And here's another stretch of beach and South Beach. So I just feel like a lot of these stretches of beautiful beach and tropical environments, I've 
been to all of the ones that I've shown in this slide and they all have the exact same malls. They all have the exact, like, it's very weird how the only thing that changes is you get a little hint of a different culture at each of these places, like the local live entertainment will be slightly different. But for the most part, they're very generic cookie cutter, you know, beach, like, you know, uh, capital ran beach societies. And I, I always wonder what's the point of traveling if you're just going to do the same thing in another location. References. And then I did want to end this with a quote that a young lady gave me while I was there. This was a woman who worked in tourism. Um, she worked with volunteer, volunteerism. So she said, it's like a double-edged blade. That tourism is in Bali now. It has been widespread over Bali for some time and become the main sector of income for the Balinese. On the bright side, it provides opportunities people for jobs and expressing themselves more by sharpening their skills like in art, which is a part of the culture, opening galleries or art workshops. It is also a gate of, it is also a gate to the world for Balinese to get more knowledge and become more open-minded. But the dark side is when Balinese cannot filter all of the worldwide culture and information that is different than Balinese culture. For example, Balinese used to use everything natural. Plates would be made from banana leaves, spoons from bamboo, etc. Sorry. Etc. Um, and so it would all be disposable. So most of the time, the food that they eat would all be biodegradable. The, the utensils that they used and the plates that they used were all biodegradable. So um, when plastic came, um, Balinese people still treated the plastic as disposable. Um, so now it has become a big issue for Bali. Also the nature, the rich paradise that once was everywhere year by year will be replaced by buildings to support the tourism industry in Bali. And since more people come, then more people will live, more people will open, and yeah, just more trash. So I, at this point, I will open it up to questions. Thank you, Ro, thank you. No problem. Yay. And um, no. if, um, if you would like to type questions in the chat, or um, if you would like to unmute your mic, ask, and then mute your mic again, whichever way uh, you would, um, like to ask the question, please do. Um, so I have some. Um, whoops, say great jobs. Ah, uh, Tara, um, because of what you learned in your research, how will you travel in the future as a tourist? Yeah, um, I mean, it's a very interesting question, uh, especially with kind of what's going on right now with everybody closing their borders. Um, my plan after school was actually to um, backpack Southeast Asia. So um, that doesn't look like it's going to be a thing with what's going on currently. Um, but I think that it makes me realize that if I'm going to travel, that I should make it an experience where I'm experiencing um, the country and what the culture has to offer. Otherwise, if I'm just looking for a nice beach, there's plenty of them around, you know. Uh, got you. Thank you. So we had two similar questions, but then um, another question from Reiner. Do you know any examples of business models in developing countries where a larger share of income, let alone the majority, uh, stay with the local community? Yeah, there's there's a few different, um, there was a few different things that I looked into that I thought was very interesting when I was um, researching tourism. Um, in Fiji, they actually have a specific tourist tax that I thought was really cool and was kind of interested in seeing if that was something that could be implemented in more countries because um, in Fiji, one, as an outsider, you're not able to buy land. You can lease up to 99 years, but you can't purchase. Um, and yeah, so they have a specific tax for anybody who's not Fijian. And in Jamaica, we pretty much have sold everything. So there's that. 
Right, thank you. And uh, another couple of questions uh, to kind of put them together also uh, address uh, two parts. So you, you really d discussed mass tourism and uh, voluntourism. And I remember in conversations with you, you were talking about how you went to study voluntourism and its impact and effects because uh, it was a bit understudied in certain respects. So, yeah. Uh, if you could, you are. Yeah. So the next questions really say, do you, how do you think that volu the voluntourism industry could be adapted in the midst of a pandemic? And um, another one is, what are some solutions you might suggest to the problems of voluntourism? So let's maybe focus a little bit on that aspect rather than the mass tourism for now. Okay, um, I would say for the first question, um, with the, the coronavirus, it's kind of just up in the air because we're in semi uncharted territory, uncharted territory because you have all of these like major airlines that are, you know, really feeling it and then the hotel industries. I'm kind of, that's one of the things I'm most interested to see the you know, the outcome of is what's going to happen to a lot of these countries where their whole economy is based on tourism, um, when that's just not happening. And then the second question was, what are some solutions? Um, some solutions that I would see would probably be oversight. And it is a system of people. So anytime you have a system of people, there's always going to be some type of flaws, but you you're, you just need oversight. Like there needs to be somebody who's managing for at least for each country, because there's been far too many incidents for this to just be an ongoing non-checked industry. Okay, got you. Goodness gracious. Okay, so we've got some uh, two more questions, which are just too good to, um, although time's running short, too good to let drop. Um, here is from Natasha uh, uh, Gordon Chippenberry. I'm very interested in the concept of accountability, as it's 90% of the global north that is present on these beaches who come and go and do not really engage beyond their um, ability to have the perfect vacation. How do locals raise the consciousness of visitors? Uh, of course, I am also interested in the dependency of locals on tourism in regards to environmental sustainability while they have to pay off the IMF and World Bank loans. So um, can you leap into that one a little bit? Yeah, so it's it's very weird because, or it's, I don't know, it's, it's a tough one because a lot of these countries are kind of cannibalizing each other in that they're fighting, they have to kind of sell themselves to these major uh, hotel companies and resorts to get them to come to their um to get to them to come to their countries so then they end up giving them all of these benefits and tax breaks and free land and you know comp things and then it just ends up you know them kind of battling each other down for these massive hotels and thank you again to our three afternoon presenters <laughs>